Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another deep dive. Busy schedule we've got this month. Uh, it's really good. So today, I'm happy to welcome Eric Helms, who's been long long-standing member of the project. Actually, just got owner on GitHub as well, I think. So well done for you. Uh, just to have someone in that time zone, I think, more than anything. But a lot of you will know him already. And I don't think we need any more introduction than that. So to, Eric's been playing around, I think, with um, with running forming containers. This is in relation to Forklift, which is our development tool set, right? Um, and so, um, if you if you played around with forklift, uh, great. Um, this is relevant. If you haven't, you should because it's really cool. Uh, and I don't think I need to say much more than that. And containers it's self explanatory, right? If you want to get involved, uh, please do. Uh, YouTube live, uh, free node, IC, free node IRC. Both of these I will be watching uh, on behalf of Eric, and I'll, I'll relay those questions as always. And the usual disclaimer. Up the quality, we can't control the default on that. So click the little button, set it to a higher resolution. It'll make everything look a lot nicer. So that's enough intro, I think. Eric, what you got? All right, thanks, Greg. Let me make sure you can see that. Yeah, that's cool. Oh man, I've forgotten where presentation mode is. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with a little presentation just to talk about uh, why, uh, what I've been working on, and a little bit of why, and a little bit of uh, intro to each of the, I guess, concerning projects. Uh, and then we're going to try a fun uh, live demo to talk a little bit about what all the pieces are. So if you're looking through the code, you have an idea, um, and just kind of show that it works. Uh, and then answer some questions at the end. All right, so uh, why containers? Um, they're popular, so that's one good reason to explore them, see what they can do for us. Um, one of my, and I'll say, this is sort of my motivations and why I thought about trying to play with it and work with it on the side, because um, it's very much been a side project for myself uh, for about six months or so. Uh, and so one of the things that I think about and when I've worked on this is the fact that we sometimes hear about varying workloads from users. Um, some users are uh, very client heavy, um, ranging from one to 60,000 nodes, and that can be clients in a pure form and puppet client sense, or uh, if you're in the Catella world of registering um, clients uh, for content, and then um, I hear a lot of, uh, or that there are people that have, you know, sort of content heavy workloads, which they have lots and lots of content, you know, gigs on gigs of content. They're trying to do multiple publishes or uh, and manage RPMs or puppet, uh, puppet modules or other types of content. Um, and that changes what a particular user may need to scale based on what their workload types are. Uh, I'm sure there are other workload types out there. Um, the other thing is uh, containers uh, provide a way to do application composition. Um, right now, we kind of install everything to one box, and there's a lot of services running. And it's not always obvious or easy to understand what all the pieces are that go into that, what are all the various um, applications, services running uh, when you install the entire stack. Um, and containers can kind of give uh, HA for free, uh, which is not a concept that we have a, I say, I would say a good solution for, or one that we talk about often um, today. Uh, so that was another big reason to look at uh, what happens if we can containerize, can we get that aspect kind of for free? Um, why containers themselves? Uh, so they uh, you know, provide immutable build artifacts uh, that you can then run. Uh, you can map containers to services. Um, so you get that sort of one-to-one -one relationship and, uh, you can think about them more individually. Uh, you can, can you know, scale the containers independently and scale them on demand. Uh, that goes back to sort of that, what is your workload? Uh, where do you need to scale up? And do you need to scale up at different times of day? Or uh, when you might be running, say, heavy content uh, workloads, or if you've got a lot of uh, clients checking in all at the same time. Maybe you need to scale up to handle that and then you want to scale back down. Uh, and something that's always been uh, tough is kind of upgrades. And 
we can kind of achieve this by sort of swapping out uh, new containers for different services to uh, get a little more granularity around upgrades. Uh, I'm sure there are there are other reasons, but some of these are some of the ones that, like I said, have motivated me to uh, work on this. Um, so now I'm going to go a little bit over the, I guess, the three, four big technologies that are being used here. Um, so just kind of keep these in the back of your mind when we get to sort of the code demo part. Uh, but I'm not sure that everyone has heard of these, so um, that's why I wanted to cover them. Uh, I imagine everyone at least has heard of Docker. Uh, you know, it's a build tool, creates static images. Um, it also provides a local container runtime environment um, for running the containers. And uh, Docker itself has a sort of like slightly newer uh, orchestration tooling uh, that's done via Docker Swarm. Uh, and I mentioned that because we're going to be talking mostly about the orchestration tool, uh, Kubernetes, and not Docker Swarm. Um, OpenShift and Kubernetes, uh, so they're an orchestration runtime. OpenShift is a platform as a service that's built on top of Kubernetes. Um, and that's the, what we'll be targeting uh, as part of this demo is OpenShift itself, not raw Kubernetes. Um, it provides high availability at the service level. And you can scale out um, a cluster by adding nodes, uh, Kubernetes nodes. You can basically just add more VMs or bare metal machines to increase the amount of uh, memory pool or CPU pool um, or create things like zones. If, for instance, you wanted to have uh, you know, Europe and North America uh, and split where you're running services across that. Uh, and it provides other things like the ability to limit resources, how much memory um, a service could consume, orchestrating of services being brought up um, or upgraded, uh, some built-in monitoring, and the ability to check the health of your applications and uh, restart them, for example, uh, if they're not functioning properly in hopes that bringing up a new version uh, or new container will start to work properly. <laughs> Um, I'd say the project that probably most people have not heard of that I've been using for building is Ansible Container. Um, it's a single tool that's for building, uh, developing, and deploying a containerized application. Uh, instead of building all of writing a Docker file for all of your containers, you write Ansible roles uh, and then combine those roles uh, to build an image. Uh, so this is, it's useful if you already have a set of roles or if instead of writing large Docker files, you want to write more composable Ansible role pieces that you can use across multiple uh, containers. Um, and in our case, we actually had a somewhat set of roles in forklift already. Um, and so that gave me a starting place. Uh, it also it allows for parameterizing your build and deploy, so you could customize your deployment uh, both from a variable perspective um, and a few other ways you'll see when we actually get to that. Uh, it is kind of a younger project. It, hasn't appro it is approaching 1.0. Um, they're working on the final set of thing of requirements, features, et cetera, that uh, they will use to define what 1.0 means. All right, so keeping all those things in mind, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was um, just give an overview of what does the containerized architecture of what I'm gonna show look like. Um, so uh, as part of this work, I've tried to document as much as I can as I go um, and write out sort of the setup as best I can. Uh, so this is a fairly uh, large document and it does not have even everything that will need to be on it um, uh, for the final application stack. Um, but I wanted to point it out and show a few things so that if you go look at this work, you kind of have an idea of what you're looking at and how to think about it. Um, so oh, general overview is um, there's volumes, just think of those as data stores uh, represented by uh, the cylinders. Uh, and that any uh, big three-dimensional rectangle you could think of as a pod 
which is a Kubernetes term for a container that uh, a it's not a container it's weird just uh, a something that holds a container or one or more containers. Um, in our case, we only have one container per pod. Uh, so you can think of each inner uh, rectangle as a service, and that's sitting inside of a pod. Uh, so any service that's connected to one of these volumes means that it needs to have that volume, that data store attached to it. Uh, and then the arrows are to try to represent and point out between services who needs to talk, be able to talk to who. Um, so in this case, um, if you look at uh, the Foreman application right here, kind of in the upper middle, um, it's a service is running Puma. Uh, and what I've tried to do here is put what is the actual um, service that's running? Uh, so in this case, it's running Puma, which is a Rails web server. Um, and it needs to have a connection and be able to talk to Cupid, which is running Cupid D. It needs to have a connection and be able to talk to Tomcat, which is what Candlepin uh, is running as. Uh, and it also needs to have and be able to talk to, say, the Postgres database, uh, which is just running Postgres. Um, the last little piece is um, I've tried to indicate here when we've exposed a uh, route or externally facing uh, IP domain that can that routes you into a service, uh, and that comes in. There's only two of those right now, uh, so that. But if you're looking at that, you can think of that as how you get an external. Those are the external uh, connections into. Uh, the application. So in this case, for example, you can't um, say talk to the memcache server directly. It is uh, not exposed to the outside world. Or uh, right now, for example, which uh, would need to change probably is the puppet server that's running is not exposed to the outside world. Um, and like I said, this is not entirely complete because it is a big complex application uh, and lots of things to consider. Uh, and I've tried to focus on getting certain workflows to work to start and then to move on to the next ones. Um, and for reference and to help out with this document, um, just to point out, <clears throat> there is, and I'll have links to this at the very end, uh, there's a document I tried to write that tries to break down uh, what all the services are, um, descriptions of them and their requirements, who they're used by, and um, if they're quote unquote a backend service, uh, as in not exposed to the outside world, um, or a third party service, so in this case, puppet server, because it's not something that we sort of make or publish ourselves, but is needed. Uh, and then sort of the main application bits um, and what they are and how they're used. All right. So uh, keeping all of that in mind, let's take a little tour of, uh, oops, I stopped sharing, uh, a little tour of the code uh, and show kind of what all the pieces are and how they work. You can see my terminal, Greg. I can. Um, I, my internet actually dropped for a couple of minutes there, so hopefully the broadcast was fine. If people, if anything went missing, just let us know, and we'll, we'll try and repeat that section. But I think I think Google carried on without me. So, but yes, your your terminal is fine. All right. Um, so, uh, let's. All right. I should note this first. <laughs> uh, bear with me. This is my first time actually presenting and talking about this, uh, so I'm trying to get it in the right order. But uh, there is a pull request open, uh, as Greg said, to forklift. And the reason I chose forklift for this work is because we've used it as a project for spinning up development uh, production environments um, for essentially deploying. Uh, and so this is another way of sort of deploying. And so I thought that forklift was a good place for this to work to live and grow. Uh, so there's a pull request out here that I update continually as I do work. Um, there's talk and discussion of what 
I need to do and what place I should get it to to get it merged. Uh, so for contribution and consumption, uh, it is entirely what I would say experimental, not per, for production yet, but it does uh, work. At least works for me every other, every other day that I use it. Um, so what I'm going to show off is what's all contained in this pull request. Uh, and what I've tried to do with this pull request and documentation is make sure that anyone new to it uh, could read through the docs, uh, the setup docs, could run this locally um, without much trouble and without having to constantly type a lot of commands and try to understand what every command is um, and simplify it down into various stages so that if you want to deep dive into a particular stage of it, uh, you can, but you can also kind of just get it running um, locally. All right, so some of this is what a um, basic container, Ansible container project looks like. Um, you have an Ansible config file. You have an Ansible requirements uh, file in case you need to install um, anything locally or any uh, dependencies, uh, Python dependencies you might need. Um, the container.yaml is what we're going to end up looking at first, and that's where all of your logic, um, all of the heft in this is contained. Um, and for those who have used Docker Compose, uh, I think you'll find that uh, this looks familiar because uh, that's what they kind of started with as the base, and it kind of uses Docker Compose under the hood for the Docker bits. The rest of everything, or everything else that you see is uh, stuff that I've added and included uh, for the, for, to make our stack work, um, including, and what is typical is to have a roles directory, and that has a series of um, all of your Ansible roles that you're going to work or use. Um, just kind of show, uh, these are all sitting in this directory currently. Um, there's work I need to do to make sure that I uh, adjust to reuse our top level roles directory. Um, but for the time being, they're sort of linked or used here. Uh, but you can see that it's all the roles and broken down into various pieces, um, allowing for better sort of composition um, and inclusion. So uh, let's take a look at what a container.yaml looks like, uh, especially ours, uh, because this is what defines what the application looks like, what all the pieces look like. Um, so the first section up here is defining some uh, base information um, that needs to be, that you don't have to define, but you can. Uh, so in this case, uh, project name uh, will set some namespacing when it generates. Uh, vault files are an Ansible um, thing where you, it's basically defining a, a file that's going to be encrypted that has key value definitions in it. Uh, and Ansible knows how to encrypt and decrypt that at different runtimes. And then we can specify some specific configuration values such as, uh, so Kates is a uh, shorthand for Kubernetes. Um, the eight stands for how many letters are between the K and the S of Kubernetes. Um, and then there we can define a few specific things like uh, what the display name, which we'll see what the description is uh, for that project when it's in Kubernetes. Um, and I say when, it's in Kubernetes because this whole thing, idea behind Ansible Container is you can define uh, all of your, everything you need here, including what you want if you're running on Docker or what you want if you're running on Kubernetes or if you want to specify or customize something if you're, say, running on OpenShift. Um, you can customize it at the deployment level um, when needed. So this default section allows us to define key values, uh, essentially variables, and define the values for them. And they're just defaults. So what I could do is specify a variable file that includes one or more of these with cu and customizes um, that value. And then that will be used in the service definitions below. 
Uh, and what that allows is us to have a basic set of defaults, um, but it also would allow, say, a user who wants to deploy this locally could come in and say, you know, I don't, I don't want this basic Postgres password that's very obvious. I want to provide my own set of um, key values um, and customize these, customize these values and have them included um, as part of the customization when I get deployed uh, for security purposes or um, just, you know, their own rules requirements that they may or may not, may not have. Uh, before I jump into services, I'm going to jump to the bottom of this file for a second. Um, because the, uh, there's a lot in the services and these other sections are a little easier to uh, define. Uh, so that there's a registries section, uh, which basically is, is defining Docker registries um, that are available. And that way you have a uh, short name that you can refer to them by. And you can specify information like the URL, namespace, username, password, if you wanted to store it in here, which I don't necessarily recommend, but you could if you wanted. Um, and this would allow you to, say, specify Docker Hub or a Kubernetes registry or some other open, uh, standalone registry that you have uh, for when you want to push your built images into it. Uh, in this case, we're specifying a local Docker registry that will be running as part of the OpenShift that we'll spin up in a bit and the namespace within it that we want. Uh, to use. Uh, the next part up here is our secrets. Um, and these are uh, both Docker and Kubernetes implement the idea of secrets, which are in encrypted values um, that are made available to your containers at runtime. And that allows you to encrypt and uh, essentially you know, make them secret. Um, and so here we can define um, what the secret is. And what this translates to is in the Ansible world, uh, where it's going to expect a, um, a key, uh, a, var a variable to be defined, whether it's through a, a, typically through a vault file, which is, again, that encrypted key value file. And it's going to expect that to have um, this key in it with some value, and it's going to map that uh, to this item uh, within the secret. So we would be creating a secret named CA, and it would have one item, CA.CRT, and it would get its value from here. Um, so you got to kind of keep, I guess, keep this in mind, and you'll see this a little more later when we get to the services and the ultimate deployment. Uh, but here I've say, define three different secrets uh, with different values within them. And again, we'll see how they're used a little bit higher up. Um, so another section is volumes. Um, think of volumes as your persistent data store. Uh, it's what you're going to want for your database. It's what you're going to want for uh, our pulp content. Uh, it's, we want it to persist, and we want to be able to mount it to our containers. Uh, and the volume section allows us to define what those volumes are. And then it allows us to customize per uh, provider if we want. Uh, so in this case, I'm able to say uh, for the Postgres data, um, I want in OpenShift, I want to be able to say, I want to set the storage to, to one gigabyte. Or at least that's how much I want to request. And I want it to be uh, you can set different access modes. Um, these are all just set to read write once. Um, you can look up and learn more about other access modes. Uh, they're not necessarily important to this. Uh, what's key is that you can, like I said, uh, override what you want. So you could, for example, say uh, OpenShift, uh, I want this to be absent. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe you want a local only or development volume only, and you don't, when you deploy to OpenShift, maybe you don't want that volume to be present. So you can set this to absent, <clears throat> um, and it would not be deployed out to OpenShift. And these are, our, again, our top level volumes, which are going to each be mounted to our services um, that we're going to see when we talk about those now. All right. So 
I'm not going to go through every service in here. Uh, most every uh, everything on the architecture diagram is represented as an entry here. Uh, but I will go through at least uh, form and base and form in because it has kind of uh, almost all of the pieces um, and just sort of talk about what everything means and how it works. Um, so <clears throat> in our case, we've decided to create uh, what we're calling a base image, right? Um, very common to do a base image that has common configuration and then build images on top. Uh, the from line says, hey, here's, uh, if, if you're a base image building on a base image uh, or another image, pull from this image. So we're saying, hey, uh, we're going we're gonna to build on top of CentOS 7. Uh, these are the roles that I want to apply uh, when this is built. Um, so I want to set up Apple. I want to set up Puppet, all the Puppet repos. Uh, I want to set them up for Puppet 4. Basically, you can pass in or configure um, variables for the role. Um, form and repos, Catella repos, and then this little form and role that's going to set up and configure all of the pieces for form and um, that I normally uh, maybe say done by the installer or things that have to be done specifically uh, in our case. And um, I will give a, a little insight or just show off just kind of what that role, for example, looks like, um, just to show what I've had to do. Um, and then the last thing, just to, which I kind of mentioned with the volumes, is in this case, I can say OpenShift uh, state absent. Um, because this is trying to map a entry to a service, uh, which we think of as a running process in uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift, um, I don't need this base image to be present in my OpenShift at all. Um, in my case, I'm building it, or we're building it so that uh, the form and image itself uh, runs, uh, builds faster, and because we're going to share it, um, and I'll show just in a second how we're sharing it. Uh, so, but in, in that case, in OpenShift, I don't need it. It's, it's not going to do me any good to try to push it out as a service, so I want it to be uh, absent. Um, so then we look at, say, the, uh, you know, the container, the service that we want for Foreman. We're saying, hey, uh, build, use this Foreman base image. Um, and it's prefixed by Foreman because that's our uh, project name that we defined above. So it's going to namespace it when it builds um, based on that. Uh, so we're saying, hey, give me the namespaced Foreman, Foreman base image, and give me the latest. So it's going to give me whatever was built from this. Um, you, this probably seems strange to have a roles and then a no op role, and it is. Uh, this is a workaround for a bug I found when working with uh, Ansible Container. I believe it's fixed. I'm pretty sure it's fixed, but I haven't gone back to retest this. I've just kept the status quo. Um, so really, you wouldn't need this uh, roles no op here. You could just say, hey. Uh, take this base image as is and use it and then customize it. Um, I would mentioned that one of the benefits of a base image is you can build it and then you can build uh, and it can, it doesn't necessarily have to change and you can change what's on top of it so you can get quicker build times. Uh, it's also that you can reuse that base image if it's uh, common between services. Uh, here, we're not really customizing that at all. But if I just jump briefly down here to form and tasks, um, it is also using the form and base image. But in this case, we also want to apply this form and tasks role on top of it, um, which is going to customize that base image, um, which, which form and task, it, it needs all of the things that form and provided. But we want to customize, say, the entry point or the command that's run at startup because we don't want to start the entire Rails application. We just want to start forming tasks. Um, so in this case, it provides us that reuse of here's the base image with all the pieces. Now we can just customize a, a little bit of how it runs and uh, what it needs to run. Now, you could try and bake all of that into uh, one mega container. 
or one mega image, I should say, and then just run whatever you need to run. Um, but I've tried to strive for only including things that are absolutely needed um, and, and you know, keep the image as trim as possible. So if we go back up here to the form an image, um, we have a command entry, uh, and this is what says, hey, uh, this is when the container starts up, uh, run this script. Um, or sorry, uh, this is what you should run to start when this container starts. Uh, and the entry point is, hey, when this container starts up, use this as your entry point. Call this, uh, basically call this command. Uh, if you don't specify an entry point, it's typically just bash. Um, so it would just be calling a script as usual, uh, but we can build some logic into the entry point um, before we hand it off necessarily uh, to the command. And you could kind of the mix and match these a little bit of what you want to put in each. And I can show a quick example of how we're using them um, right now. Uh, but that's sort of the difference between the two. Uh, environment is specifying environment variables, which are made available as environment variables in the container when it's running. Um, we'll see a brief example of how that's used. Uh, ports is what says map this to the outside world. Uh, in OpenShift land, this is what creates a route or an external. And this says, hey, map this external port to this internal port. Um, expose is slightly different in that it only exposes the port as a service on the internal network. Um, if that's a Docker running locally, then it's just a port uh, that's exposed. And if it's in Kubernetes OpenShift land, it's uh, exposing a what's known as a service port so that other services can talk to it, uh, talk to this service at this port. Um, bef below we saw top level secrets. Um, this is the taking those top level secrets and um, specifying them for a single container. Um, <clears throat> and the way this works is you say secrets and what the name of the secret was. So if you recall down below we had three secrets, CA, keys, and certs. So here I'm saying, hey, take the, for the key secrets in OpenShift, I want you to mount that secret at this path. And what that translates to is it creates a volume mount. So it basically mounts the secrets as a path um, inside the container and makes them basically available at this directory structure. And Specifying items uh, says, hey, within the key secret. So I could just say, hey, deploy the entire, everything in this secret, deploy it to this directory. Or I can say, hey, um, I want to only pick and choose a, a few specific items where I want to customize the deployment of those secrets. So I can say, within the key secret, grab the ca.key item uh, and then deploy it at ca.key. Um, I could just as easily say, hey, uh, deploy this as uh, ca1.key. And just to show, it would translate to, uh, if you were thinking about it on the file system, it would end up as ca1.key. But I don't have to specify the full path because we can say, hey, relative to this path, deploy these as, deploy this as this, right? Uh, and I can define as many of those as I want. Um, different secrets and where their mount points. And uh, this little just example is you can also then deploy them as an environment variable, um, which is uh, what Kubernetes allows. Uh, but you could specify, hey, deploy this key in the secret. So whatever this item, ca.cert, deploy its value into the environment variable, uh, woot, woot. <clears throat> And then it's up to you how you use it, uh, but it is made and available that way. Um, secrets are not 
specific to OpenShift. Um, there are Docker secrets now. You do not see them implemented here because uh, I'm waiting on the someone from the Ansible container team to implement that side. I implemented the secret side for Kubernetes and OpenShift and they are implementing the Docker side. Uh, but basically, you'll be able to specify um, Docker specific configuration and information in the same structure uh, for if you're running it on uh, Docker versus Kubernetes or OpenShift. Um, the last thing is similar to volumes that we saw before, you can specify overrides or specific information that you want to set um, for a given provider. So in OpenShift, I want for, uh, Foreman application and service to be present. And I want to customize uh, the deployment by saying I override the deployment. So when, one thing that happens kind of under the hood is when you, this entire definition here of a service gets turned into a uh, Kubernetes deployment, um, which then is what trigger turns into a pod, which is again, that thing that's running a container. And in this case, I'm saying, hey, for the deployment here, I want you by default to set the replicas to two, uh, which is basically saying, hey, when you deploy the form and service, I want two of them to be running by default from the get-go. Um, so we're, it's kind of like we're saying, by default, let's go ahead and start out in a scaled setup, in an HA setup, um, so that we can uh, kind of get used to that and we can test that uh, every time. All right. Um, one thing the Foreman service doesn't do that I just want to show real quick is um, <clears throat> it doesn't have any volumes mounted to it. It has secrets mounted to it, but it doesn't have any volumes. Uh, so just to kind of show, in this case, um, if we look at the Postgres application, it has a volume specified, and it's saying, hey, uh, mount the volume named Postgres data at the path varlib pg sql slash data. And so it'll mount that volume we saw defined down below <clears throat> at that point. Um, you are not limited to mounting a volume uh, to one uh, container. Uh, just to show real quick, sorry, bouncing around a little bit here. If I look at a pulp worker, it has uh, mounted the pulp data volume at varlib pulp and the puppet data volume at Etsy puppet. And then if we look at our puppet container, which is just running a puppet server, we mount that same puppet data volume at Etsy puppet. And now the puppet service uh, has the same volume mounted and has this access to the same data so that if Pulp publishes puppet modules to that volume, the puppet server then has access to that. And now, I know that's a lot to take in. There's a lot of services, as you can see here. Um, <clears throat> but it shows sort of the complexity and all the things that it takes kind of to deploy our application. Um, and all of the pieces, and I think it covers all of the pieces that you're going to see when you look at the definitions of what do all these things mean and what do they translate to. Um, what I did mention was, and I just kind of want to show this for... Uh, so people have some idea what these things do. Um, if we look at the Foreman role itself, what I've had to do, or what it does, I'm allowed, what basically I can do is define Ansible tasks. Um, and what, in, in uh, each task that needs to be done, uh, there's things that I guess are more common done by either, uh, say, a forklift deployment, which is using Ansible or if you're running these commands by hand as a user installing a normal uh, standalone VM or bare metal installation, you might be running. Uh, but you can you know, install packages. Uh, in this case, you can see I'm installing a variety of plugins into the environment. Um, I'm deploying the database.yaml file, settings.yaml file, uh, Catello's configuration file, um, 
you can see here I had to do, I had to remove this file because it was causing issues running the container. Um, I don't know if that's a long-term thing, but I stuck, you know, I went for what was going to work. Uh, and yes, you'll see where I've uh, thrown in a couple patches um, where I have had to do this to get it work in this environment. And I've had to do this prior with this work. And what I've done is typically uh, I've gotten these code changes properly pushed and merged into the code bases uh, for the projects where I've run into these to help with this work. And then the last thing just to show is the, these uh, some files um, that get put in place, like the entry point, the form and start script, <clears throat> a wait on Postgres script, and a create uh, queue script. And I just want to show one of those real quick to kind of show what I mean. And so this entry point calls this wait on Postgres. And this is so that we basically spin and, and the service can spin up and wait for Postgres to be initialized and then move on to migrating the database, seeding the database, and then it'll hand off uh, execution over to um, starting the application up, uh, which is nice because that means in the Docker and OpenShift environment, we can wait for the proper backend services to be spun up before we move to the next operation. Uh, whereas in OpenShift and Kubernetes, they have things called lifecycle hooks, which uh, Docker, last I checked, doesn't have, but it's possible they've added something like this. But uh, this sort of provides a gen general and generic solution for all of those environments. Um, and so this is a lot to put into a short of this, this hour, so I kind of want to, I'm going to move ahead and so I can kind of just show okay. everything. Can I just jump in there? We did have one question before you move on. I don't know. Maybe you're going to come to this, so stop me if, if you are. But so the question that's come up is about upgrades when it comes to, to pods and, and containers. So is that something you're looking at covering, or should we just very quickly talk about that? Uh, I have not tried it yet myself, but locally when I work on this a lot of times, I will build a specific, I'll alter one role and rebuild that image and then push just that new image out to the OpenShift and then restart that deployment, uh, which so you can think of that as kind of a, a upgrade. So, so you're uh, doing the database migrations and things, rebuilding it as a new image and pushing that out rather than having that happen as part of the image? Yes, right okay, now. That's cool. That, but that I haven't spent a lot of time. That was basically the question. So it's like, you know, is it, an, is it an image, an upgrade image, or is it an image that maintains itself is basically the question that came up. Um, and I guess one, the other thing that's gone with that is, is just a piece of feedback, and maybe we will get to this at the end, but it's a question of what, what might we change in, in the application to make this easier in the future is one, one possible way to think about it as well. But that's possibly a topic for the, for the end if we have time. So. Yeah. Uh, like There is a lot to consider and some more advanced topics that I have yet to get to or try uh, because of the size of the application. So sure. uh, I am welcome to. I, I plan to address those. I'd love help looking into different parts. There's definitely ways to split this out. Um, but let me quickly kind of show real quick, uh, just so you have an idea. So with Ansible Container, if you want to build, you can run Ansible Container Build. It builds everything. Or you can say dash dash service and say type. Uh, you say form and base. We build the form and base image and the form and image only. And that'll limit the scope of what you're rebuilding. Um, I'm not going to run that because it's going to take too long. Uh, the other thing you can do, which I won't exactly show, is you can run do Ansible container run. And this runs all of those images in using Docker locally. Uh, and this has caveats due to the size of our application, uh, port availability, because you can't reuse the same port, um, to use the run with our large stack. Um, so I haven't focused a ton on it, but the idea is would be to be able to allow both, because in theory, your Ansible container run is kind of your local development environment. Let me spin this up locally on just Docker, have everything available and work on it there versus spinning up uh, and using OpenShift. Um, but what I'm going to jump to is, if you came here and tried this with OpenShift, what would it kind of look like? Uh, so I've built a little uh, Ansible playbook that will spin up a local Ansible cluster, or not Ansible, OpenShift cluster. This should do everything that's needed for you to get this up and running. Um, if you can see there on screen, I have this little install OpenShift tools. That will install and set up 
what's needed to run this playbook for you. Um, <clears throat> there's also a playbook, um, just real quick. Also a little playbook for installing and setting up Ansible container locally for you, um, especially with my branch with the secrets work that hasn't been merged yet. Um, <clears throat> but this, I do, I've used this because it's simpler. It spins up a local cluster on uh, with Docker locally. Uh, and just to show that it's up and running, because we'll come back and visit it. Um, I can click that link and there we go. Just log in with the base developer account and you can see these various projects, but our little project Foreman, it's empty right now, nothing going on. All right, so we'll go back to, there we go. Um, we'll come back here and, um, and after that I have uh, another little playbook called Deploy and um, it's, just real quick, I can kind of show you. It's not doing a lot, but it's doing enough. So it makes sure that there's a Foreman project. Um, it's going to generate uh, certificates that are needed, and that's what's going to create our secrets. And it's going to make sure that secrets file gets copied in. And then it's going to create, uh, do the deploy. Uh, and so I'll talk, while it does this, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about what it's, each stage is doing. Uh, so this is generating a CA cert, uh, some keys, um, <clears throat> a Catello RPM. Oh, sorry, this is some of my ongoing work. Um, uh, so it'll create these certs that are needed. It'll create this uh, Catello uh, client RPM for installing and then being able to register. Uh, and then it's going to create a secrets file out of that, copy that secrets file um, out uh, into an Ansible deployment directory. And then it's going to generate a deployment role. Uh, and that's where a lot of this heavy lifting. So it's turning that container.yaml file into an Ansible playbook using uh, some Ansible Kubernetes modules with all of our configuration in it. And uh, it's building all of the pieces that are needed um, and putting them in there. So it's it's creating uh, service definitions, it's creating volume definitions, it's creating secret definitions, um, and it essentially serves as a way to uh, deploy and roll out uh, all the services in our um, container.yaml, and it will put in place, uh, say, variable definitions for the secrets. And it'll also, um, uh, for, the, for the secrets get turned into variables, so you'll never see secrets stored directly in the deployment playbook. Um, but what you'll see are variables in there, and it expects those variables to be defined within some secrets, a secrets file that you've, uh, uh, or sorry, an Ansible vault file uh, that you've defined in the container.yaml. So in our case, it was the secrets.yaml um, file that we had specified at the top. It's gonna to expect that that exists and that that has all of the secrets needed in it. <clears throat> um, this deployment role um, does take a little bit to generate, but it's one of those where unless you change container.yaml and you change the deployment configuration, you don't actually have to deploy it or change it. Um, but what I can show is So one of the things it also is doing is pushing the images out. Um, so I can show, give you a little idea. Uh, and that's one reason it can take a little long is it's pushing all of the images out. Uh, so we can see that this is starting to get populated with um, the images as they get pushed out to the registry. Uh, and that's a registry that's running as part of OpenShift. Um, so all, uh, Again, I pre-built all of these images because they would take too long, um, but it's going to push all these images here and so they're available. And you'll note that I said the form and base we had set to absent in OpenShift, um, which means it's absent as a service, but it's not absent as an image. Uh, so it still pushes the image out to the registry, uh, but it won't create a service when we actually run uh, the deployment. 
Um, but all images that are built are then pushed and, like I said, made available. Um, they are also locally available, just to kind of show. Um, <clears throat> for example, you can see here, um, there's the form and task image that I built uh, a couple weeks ago. It's here and available in, the in, the, in, in just the basic Docker uh, registry that's running. So Docker, you know, you can just stock your images and there's all your... There's all your images, and then you can see, oh, it pushed it to the uh, registry here, and that image, that's the one that's running inside uh, and made available to OpenShift. Uh, so when Ansible Container builds right now, it builds with, with Docker in, in the standard sort of Docker build way. Um, but it's not uh, the only way that you can build um, going forward. There is work, say, ongoing to use uh, Builda, which is the uh, open container initiatives runtime uh, that doesn't require Docker to build images. Um, so just real quick to kind of show, now there's this Ansible deployment directory, has the secrets in it. Uh, in the roles directory there is the Kubernetes modules role. Uh, this is what it generates. Uh, generates a playbook with tasks for say creating the project, uh, Secret, um, etc. Which I can let me kick this off and I'll show you. Uh, so I'm going to run Ansible playbook because it's just a playbook, and I'm going to tell it to use the start tags, um, which is going to start creating and populating uh, all of the various services, secrets, and volumes uh, into the OpenShift environment. So that usually doesn't take that long to do. So here we go. I'm afraid I was getting my first live demo hiccup. Uh, just to show a little more of that while it deploys. Um, <clears throat> so you can see, like, create this secret uh, using Kubernetes. Uh, you can see it's creating a resource definition, which is, this is what kind of a Kubernetes resource looks like. It's of type secret. The data, if you recall from the secrets, it's pulp.key. And it's saying, hey, grab this Ansible variable, pulp underscore key, base64 encode it, because Kubernetes requires every secret to be base64 encoded, uh, and include that. And it'll pull that from this defined vars file here at the top. Uh, which is our secrets.yaml. Uh, and so this is going to, um, it's going to run for a little bit, um, and then I'll be able to show you kind of what it's doing. The secrets take the longest to do. Greg, I'm afraid I took longer than I thought, so I don't know how many questions I'll actually be able to get to. Uh, there's only one which we can possibly do while this is running. Um, how easy is this to run on Minikube, or is it really a full Kubernetes setup to play with it? Um, I haven't used Minikube yet myself um, because I've stuck to open OC cluster up, which OC cluster up um, runs a local cluster with just Docker containers. So if I look at Docker right. uh, PS, what's running, you can see like, here is OpenShift origin running as a Kubernetes, uh, or sorry, not as Kubernetes, as a Docker container locally. So this is by no means a full Kubernetes environment or an OpenShift environment that's running remotely or on bare metal. So Minikube or Minishift is just another way of spinning that up locally. It uses a VM. I'm just using uh, Docker sure, directly. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, so basically the short answer is no idea, uh, comments welcome, right? Yeah. Um, I've tried to limit it to one way of deploying OpenShift just so I have a repeatable environment and others could have a repeatable environment, but I'm open to uh, other feedback ideas. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay. Um, I can just briefly answer while that deploys um, so Ohad had a couple questions. He couldn't make it, so he posted a few questions. Um, and I'll go through these as best I can um, while it finishes. Um, so he asked about smart proxy features. I honestly have not touched 
much of any of the smart proxy features. I've really only got a smart proxy running. I haven't tried to see what it would be like to do DNS or THCP or puppet management yet. Um, to do pulp and do a Catello sync, which is one of my main workflows to try out, you need a smart proxy right now. And so I have one deployed for that reason, but I haven't touched it very much. Um, Ev versus production. I've tried to look at this from production. I haven't really played a ton with, here's how you can develop, but there are strategies for this. Um, Ansible container uh, run, if it's, once it's all working, for example, you could locally mount, um, or open, Ansible container has what's known as dev overrides, so that in development, which is the run feature, you could mount a volume, a local volume, for example, in development, and that could be, say, you're mounting your source code into the container when it runs. Uh, OpenShift also has ways that we could mount a host directory, so you can mount, potentially mount the source code that way, so running the full OpenShift environment. There's also an OpenShift strategy I had read about where you use uh, rsync, you set up rsync, and it'll rsync it into the running container so you can make local changes and see it um, right away. Um, all right, so since this is done, I'm going to move away from those questions just to kind of show that it, it populated and there are things running. Um, so you can see on this dashboard, there's lots of stuff running. Um, slightly better way to see it is go to deployments, and you'll see all these deployments that are up and running at the moment. Um, we could dive into, say, the Foreman one, and we can see that there's one deployment running. Uh, we can see that two of the pods, one is active, one is running, one has a warning currently. Um, we can see that it, it has these secrets mounted into it. You can see more information about those secrets mounted. Uh, we can see it went blue, so both are now supposedly running. So let's click on one. When we're looking at a pod, which is a running instance uh, with multiple con one or more containers in it. We can still see all that mount information, see lots of statistics about it. Uh, we can go look at the logs uh, to see what it's doing, and you can kind of see that it's migrating the database right now. Uh, and it's going to just keep spamming lots and lots of information. Um, you can see another thing is you can go to a running terminal, which is a nicety of OpenShift, and I can browse around and look at the container I could look at different logs. Um, I could check that what deployed, deployed the way I thought it was going to deploy. Um, it's a lot of open shifty things that you can do, which are nice. Um, if we go to routes, um, just to kind of at least be able to show, hey, this is running and stuff. Uh, it's still migrating the database, so it might not be up yet. Um, you can see it says site can't be reached yet. Now the application is not available. Um, and that's just because, like I said, it's still spinning up. Um, so let's check and see where the Foreman one is at. We can do that kind of by looking at the logs. So there's a lot of things that could be optimized that don't work really well right now, uh, but it looks like the app is running, uh, such as migrating the database, generating the cache, Let's see, it does appear to be started. A lot of this is in transition, so if something's going to fail, it's going to, of course, be the uh, live demo side of things from where I had to move from my house uh, to the office. What we can do is just check that no pods failed. So only this proxy register failed, which is fine. Everybody else seems to be up and running. So I'm going to get down to the wire and not even be able to show you that the application is running. Uh, so there's there's the one live demo fail. Like I said, it. Um, I have a lot in transition as I work with this a lot. Um, This could be a result of the app still just partially starting because um, I've recently added a lot. And like I said, it, it, right now it takes a lot to start up and it can be optimized. So if you need to 
cut me off, Greg. Feel free to at any time. Oh, there we go. And oh, right a, the a last second save. Right. Um, well, I think that's all we have time for. And I think that's uh, a pretty good point to stop as well, given that you've actually got it up and running. Um, so thank you very much. Unless there's anything else, you could, we've probably got a few seconds left if you want to show anything last thing. Um, actually my database use, but... seating didn't work, so I don't <laughs> actually that? know the password yet. Uh, but I will say that uh, if people would like to see more, uh, please check out the pull request if they would like to. Uh, ha I think there's a lot here, and I'm willing to do more deep dives to get into more specific topics, especially as I go along. Uh, this has been six months of work that I tried to put into an hour, so that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a huge amount to try and get into one hour, absolutely. Um, and it looks pretty awesome. I'm really interested to, to play around with it if I have time. But well, I say that to just about everything because it's all fascinating. Um, so I'm not going <laughs> to expect much. But um, but yes, I think it's pretty interesting stuff. So that's all we have time for then, I think. Um, and a really good place to stop. Thank you very much, Eric, for your time. Um, and thanks for the questions, which were mostly from Ohad, uh, even the ones I was relaying to the channel, at least. Um, Fascinating stuff, as always. Uh, if you want to know more about this, or you want to get involved, you know where to find us: IRC, mailing lists, etc. Come talk to to Eric, and and we'll figure this out, and we'll see where we can take it. In the meantime, um, this has been an excellent deep dive. Thank you very much for watching. Do take care. <laughs>